The following interview was conducted with Antonio Mugana, the Director of Diversity for the uh, College of Technology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, August 18, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon to you. Thank, Thank you. you. So let's start by tell, tell us where and when you were born and your early years. Okay. Well, first of all, my name is Antonia Manguilla. Thank you. Okay. And um, I was born in Puerto Rico many years ago. And uh, my husband... It was like yesterday. No, it was a long time ago, but it's okay. Um, my husband and I moved to the Purdue area, Lafayette area, some 16, 17 years ago. And um, he was transferred here with his job cat in cat with caterpillar can we back to tell did you go to grade school and high school in puerto rico do you want to talk more uh, about that or, actually or? i was born in puerto rico oh. and at, at the age of 14 months my parents moved to the states oh okay and right. so i came where, here where were what, you where were you raised a uh, part of the time it was in elgin illinois and the other part was in aurora which is both of them are suburbs of sure. chicago okay and uh, when i went to kindergarten didn't know a word of english and uh, then went through kindergarten through high school uh, attended the University of Illinois for a while that's where I met my husband didn't quite finish um, we got married and started having children and then um, uh, when he graduated uh, from the University of Illinois we moved to Peoria Illinois from Peoria which is caterpillar country then we moved uh, to Lafayette because he was transferred here with, with Caterpillar? With Caterpillar. Okay. He's still with them. Okay. And when I moved here, I thought, oh, wow, what a great opportunity for me to um, go back to school and you sure. know, get my degree. And so, yeah, in 1990, we moved here in 1992. And then, so I started going to, kind of had some little jobs here and there, started, went back to school and got my degree. And then I started working... Um, with the Office of Admissions as an assistant director. And, um, what, did you, you know, what school did you get your degree from? I actually got a degree from the College of Consumer and Family Science, Individual and Family Studies. Okay. And, um, and like I said, it was a perfect degree because you know, I talked to families all the time. You know, this was a big transition time for their children and for the families. And so it really worked out well. You sure. know, my degree really fit in there. Yeah. And um, how did the opening come in admissions? Did you, you wanted to stay on campus? Were you looking for something on campus? Yeah, I, I just, they were looking for some, and I just applied, you know, just like anyone else. And I don't know if, you know, they were maybe looking for some diversity. They wanted to sure. you know, diversify their office a little bit. And I know that there were, they had two, two females that were leaving, and one was African American, one was Hispanic, and so they didn't. Sure. And so I think I walked in at the right time okay. with the okay. right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about your children? How old are they? And do they? They're all graduated. Uh, actually, two of them graduated from Purdue. Okay. Um, my my son, when we moved here, my youngest was in third grade middle child was in fifth grade and my daughter was in seventh grade it was a difficult time for them yeah. to to move because especially the seventh grader because you know it's just teenage it's, it's, years and right yeah, and they had their friends there yeah right it was a difficult time um, but they soon adjusted you know uh, west side schools very good schools and um yeah they adjusted well and so and they came to Purdue. Yeah, they graduated from West Side. My daughter did not want to go to Purdue because she said, I've lived here already. I want to go somewhere else. And so she applied to IU and other schools and ended up at BYU. And then my boys said, I don't want to go somewhere else. I'm a Purdue fan. I'm a Boilermaker. You know, they had grown up going to the games and all, all right, of that. All that. So for them, it was no choice. It was like, yeah, this is where I want to be. They, they have a cousin that... Um, attended University of Michigan and actually went to a couple of football games with him and, and Purdue thought, Michigan games. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. not sure which ones, but sure. I remember they went. And one of my sons, he said, "What am I doing here?" At, at one point, he was probably 15, 16. I don't know, maybe maybe 17. I'm not sure, but he was he was in his teenage years, and he said, "What am I doing here?" I'm not a Michigan fan, I'm a Purdue fan. And that was it, you know. And so Purdue was the place. And anyway, he graduated, and then my other son came here and graduated as well. Good. My first one graduated from liberal arts in 
uh, communications and graphic design, and then the youngest graduated in mechanical engineering technology. And they both have jobs. They're doing very well. Do you, where, where else do they live? Uh, the one in mechanical engineering technology lives in Houston, Texas. He uh, just graduated recently, and he works for a company by the name of Slumberjay. Really likes it there, and he's doing well. I mean, he hasn't been laid off or anything like that. Yeah. And um, uh, it's a good town for single young men, I think. You know, yeah. he likes it. The second son. Uh, graduated, like I said, from liberal arts, had a job in Indianapolis, but lost it in the this, this spring because of layoffs and the company was just going under. And um, happened to be helping his sister who's in law school in, in Utah. Your during, daughter's in law school? Yeah, my daughter's in law school. And so he was helping her with her baby during this time uh, because he didn't have a job. He goes, well, I'll help her during finals. I'll go over there and stay. And while he was there, he was looking on Craigslist for just job openings, something, because he's always looking. Sure. And, well, next thing you know, there was a job on Craigslist that fit him to the T. You know, they needed someone who, web design and communications and graphic designer, and uh, that's exactly what he had gotten his degree in. And it happened to be 15 minutes away from where he was at at the moment in time. And so he applied, they called him the next day and asked him if he could come for an interview. He goes, well, I, yes, you're gonna have to do it now because I'm leaving on Thursday. So the next day he went in for an interview um, and then Thursday he came home and then on Friday they offered him the job. And so he's been working there three months and he and loves he it. He does. It. Yeah, he likes it. That's good. Oh, yeah. that's nice. So a Purdue degree gets you very, lots of places, yes, that's for that's sure. Right. Well, let's talk about the Latino Cultural Center for the researchers. Uh, she's going to talk about the early days and how it came about and things. So okay, I'll leave it great. Up to you. Yes. Go ahead. <clears throat> well, um, like I was mentioning earlier, I was in the Office of Admissions as an assistant director. And, you know, I was a student here, had gotten my degree. I had met a lot of the students. And there was one young woman, I think her name was Araceli Sanchez, who. Uh, I would call on her to kind of help me sometimes with some of our programs or if I needed a, a speaker. And she was a junior, senior, somewhere in that. You know, she was getting older, she could do those things. And she was involved on campus, was part of one of the Hispanic sororities. And um, she came up to me and asked me if I would help or be the advisor to, for this LULAC organization that they had started. Because they were trying to organize the Latino students and, and have them come together. Yeah. Can you tell us uh, about approximately what time would this have been? This, I want to say, in the year 2001, okay. probably, okay. maybe Researchers the end of 2000. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was a big, like, yeah, 2001 or so. Sure. And um, I said, sure, you know, I'll help you. I'll do whatever, whatever you guys need. I'll be your advisor. Because to be a student organization, you need an advisor. So um, I remember it was her, Magali Castro, and Carlos Ariola that got together first. And then um, they were having, a, this LULAC was kind of more of a political organization, and they were part of a larger kind of organization. And so they were thinking, you know, this is probably not the best organization to really put everybody together. And so they said, why don't we change the name to the Latino Student Union? I said, sure, you know, I'm just their support there. I was like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And they were talking about they wanted a la la Latino cultural center. They were saying all the other schools around here, you know, University of Illinois, IU, they all have Latino centers. We need one here at Purdue. And that was kind of one of their main goals. Well, after that, talking to them, you know, and, and uh, said, I'll support you in whatever way that I can, uh, Dorothy Simpson Taylor contacted me, and she was the diverse, director for the diversity office for the college, the Purdue University, the entire university. And uh, she was wanting to do something for Hispanic Heritage Month. And she contacted several Latino faculty and staff that she thought might be able to support her and help her in putting this together. And I said, sure, I'll help you. Went to a meeting. I think Joel Sarate went to that meeting. There was two or three, several people that attended. And 
um, she wanted to have activities for this this Hispanic Heritage Month, and I was like, oh, I'm not sure. I mean, you can run it. I, I'll support you, but you know, I'm gone sure. traveling and recruiting. But she said she wanted student support, and I said, well, I can help you with that. I'll contact some of the students. Um, I'm in contact with a lot of them, and let's see if we can get a group together. So. I think, I want to say it was either August, it was in the beginning of the year, August, early September. And, no, I think it was in August, and um, we got the, the Hispanic sororities, the Hispanic fraternities, uh, some like a Brazilian organization, um, Amigos Hispanos, there were all these different student organizations, and we got them all together in a round table kind of like this and presented them the idea of having a Hispanic Heritage Month or needing their support for that. And they all said, yes, we'd love to do that. And so students took on, you know, different tasks of, well, you know, I'd like to do a cultural night. This is something that we do already. The Sigma Lambda Beta, they do a cultural dinner, you know, during this time. And so they put it all to, you know, got that together. And uh, they put on a fair with all the different countries that represent Latin America. And, um, and you know, something about them. Because we had student or students from all over the world and uh, from a lot of different countries. And so they, they did a, a, a fair like that out in the Memorial Mall. Um, we, one of the sororities did a... Um, kind of like a admissions and kind of preparation of college for the community and for parents and students that they knew had a, uh, from a school that had a large um, Hispanic population. So they did that and we put that together. Because I remember I actually spoke at that and you know, oh. was one of the speakers for the students and, and to kind of encourage the parents and let the parents know how important education was for the students. And that we're here to help and we can... Right, and to let them know so that they can connect with us. Sure. And so, so anyway, the students did this, this Hispanic Heritage Month. And this was, it was in the fall of 2001. And after that, they got together and they just loved being able to have this one voice and to represent and... Pulling all the groups together. And putting them all together under sure. one umbrella. So they decided to then have this Latino Student Union. Well, they already had a Latino Student Union. So... Um, but they decided, well, let's let's really have one, all of these organizations under this one umbrella. And then they had elections. And when they had elections, the young woman that had originally, Araceli, was the president, you know, she was not voted in as a president. The president was then Augie Torres. He was the person that was voted in. And they had these rules. I don't remember. And there were some, I'll be honest, there were some a little conflict between the different um, sororities and fraternities and, and you know just a little and I I just tried to kind of support as best as I could and then Augie had another um, woman what was her her name was uh, Nell Martinez and he wanted her to be part of the uh, the advisor I said sure that's fine so she kind of helped support as well and so it was Nell and myself and Augie and then the rest of the board, vice president, and um, and we're surprised how it could, sounds like a good sized group. It was. It was a, actually probably some thirty students or so at good. the time, and they were all leaders, you know, because they, they belong to other. In, yeah, and and they all belong to other organizations. So yes, and then um, and they 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 started, you know, formed a um, a. Charter or like a um, what's that called when they 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 got organized and they got organized and created a what's that called I forget a constitution a constitution that's the word for the organization sure. and they bylaws you know, and whatever exactly right. and they planned all that because that really wasn't well planned before it was just it was LULAC and it had been switched to LSU and that's pretty much you know all that really had been done and so they did that. And then I think it was Augie contacted President Jiski and said, you know, we're this organization. We'd like, uh, you know, to have a moment of your time and let you know, you know, what our concerns are for the Latino students here on campus. And, and President Jiski heard them. And he was interested in what they had to say. 
He and, met with them. And he met with them. Mm -hmm. And I think then he asked Provost Mason if she would kind of head this up and, and meet with the students some more, get, get um, kind of a list of, of their you their know, needs or yeah, their, their, their needs. goals and what they wanted. Exactly, yeah. Uh, just, um, see. yeah, she, Provost Mason wanted to know what were the top needs facing the Latino community and the LSU at Purdue. And um, see, by this time, I'm trying to think now, Augie was president, you know, because it takes time. And he met a couple of times with, with Provost Mason and I think um, she was able to find a room, I'm not sure if it was at Stewart Center, someplace, um, kind of get them together. And then next thing you know, she actually found the uh, South, Campus Court. South Campus Courts building. She, and it was, I remember this, it was towards the end of the year. It was in the springtime. Everybody was so excited. And by that time, I think Nell Martinez had left. She... Um, had gotten another job with another university, and then I think Dr. Uh, Angelica Duran came on, and she was involved with wanting also to get the Latino faculty and staff together, and so she was asked to kind of come on board with that. And so, you know, um, we met Augie and I and, and uh, uh, Angelica Duran and the provost met a few times just to kind of you know, get these things, and sure. what we were just saying, we need some place where the students can congregate, yeah. and so um, we had this building, and it didn't have any staff at the time. The staff was the students; they were the ones kind of putting it together, being there, and it was open like from five to nine. Was there any furniture in there? Not really in the beginning; no. very minimal. I think um, I'm trying to think if that's when Hoel came in as okay. well, and then he was able to support with us with that. Well then, you know how students graduate and leave. Augie graduated, and then Hansel Monroy became the president of the Latino Student Union. And um, things then really started moving faster, a lot faster. You know that yeah, we got nice furniture in there. Uh, you know the students would meet. They uh, and they had a facility and they could go with it. Right, and they went with it. Uh, they got computers. They got. Uh, uh, you know, wasn't my, uh, assistant provost uh, Margaret Rowan, wasn't she helping you yes, too? Okay. Yes, and then that's when okay. um, after, I, I want to say in, okay, this email was in July 12th, 2002, where uh, Hansel was now the new president for the LSU, and Provost Mason had asked him to, um, you know, list some things that they thought that they needed. And actually, he, you know, he has written here. Uh, he goes, here's a list of what the Latino and the LSU needs. LSU office meeting space, perhaps a university-owned house, closed. Oh, so I guess, yeah, this is designated as a Latino cultural center, much like the BCC was started some years ago. Create a task force of senior-level university officials, including you if possible, that will work closely with the Latino Student Union and the Latino Faculty and Staff Association to affect positive changes for and address issues of the Latino members of the Purdue family. Currently, these issues include attract and retain quality students and faculty and staff, raising the awareness of the whole campus to the Latino Latin culture, assessing the, the state of minority opportunity programs on campus, and involving Latin alumni in university activities. And then uh, he wanted commitment and support, political, financial, and otherwise, from the university administration to make Purdue a welcoming campus to Latino Latin students. This support will be demonstrated by the success of a task force in creating positive changes. And then uh, uh, Sally uh, Mason replied, this is July 2002, and said, Hansel, thank you for the list. I believe it is well thought out and very doable. And she said, I'd like to get together with you either bef just before or after the semester starts so we can map out a strategy for putting your ideas in place. And I will ask my administrative assistant to find a good time for us to meet. And I would like, also like to include Professor Duran in the conversation, if that is okay with you. I just 
uh, looked at our freshman class, and then she says that it had increased by 43%. And so, yeah. So I'm trying to think. I think the first thing we got was just a little office, with, and then, then, you got the and then we got the facility after that. Yeah. And actually, then, um, yeah, and I remember I was part of that conversation. I'm not sure if Hoel was there or not. But I remember Professor Duran, I remember Hansel, and I think a couple other students sure, were there okay. at that conversation right. with her. And then I think that's when she, once she got things going and gave him the, the, the facility. The uh, keys. The keys, exactly. Uh, to South Campus Courts, uh, then she turned it over to Provost Stroll. Right. And, okay. and that's when she came in. Right. And then the rest... What you came know. next? Then were you in? Then they started. Look, was that at that point just when they started looking for a director? No. Oh. Uh, did they have? It was run by the students for a while. I want to say almost a whole year. Well, did you continue to stay on as an advisor? I stayed as an advisor for the Latino Student Union. Oh, okay. And um, because they were the ones who were running it, you know, yeah. I had another job that I was actually doing, and I was just their support. Um, and so. One head can only wear so many hats. Yeah, yeah. Um, they they got a, a secretary or somebody to be there during the day, sure. and that was oh, okay, how can I forget her name? She was so cute and so sweet, and because she stayed on once Maricela came on, um, and I'm sure Maricela wrote her name. I can't no. remember her name now. That's okay. That's okay. Okay, yeah. Um, but. Yeah, she was hired on, but the students were the one running the facility. It was open from five to nine every every night, and uh, they held meetings there. They held. Um, I'm trying to think. If I remember, probably had some programs. Then. They had some programs that they put together. Um, they had Domino Night, which is a very uh, a favorite a Hispanic pastime. Um, they they had free salsa lessons that they were having, and but the only thing is they had such a turnout for that that they had to change the location because the facility wasn't big enough. I've been in there, so I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, they would have e-board meetings there, and the other organizations would meet there as well. So that's basically kind of how it started. Right. Then how did were you involved at all in the search? And then they then the search started. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, did Margaret Rose say we're going to have a search for? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then yeah, they searched and. Were you on the committee? I was asked to be on the committee, but I had kind of wanted to see if I could be on, you know, be part considered for that. And then um, that's exactly at the same time that I got this other position as the director of diversity programs in the College of Technology. Okay. And so it didn't work out for me, but they got a great person with Maricela. She is wonderful, and she's done a great job with them. And I had a new position that I really enjoyed, and um, so it, yeah, worked out. it worked out. It right. really did. Um, did. Now, that I've been to their new, their new place. Did that take place after you, I mean, after she came? Because when she first came, was she down, still down on South Campus? Yes, Clark? yes, okay. she was. And actually, even before Maricela came on, they had a grand opening in the spring. I, th um, I think I remember reading about that. Yeah. <sighs> Let me think. See, this is all, some of these are, are starting. I'd have to look at my notes and see exactly That's okay. when. But yeah, th the students put together, and I actually have pictures of the students. We had Carlos Morales, who is a, he was a student here at Purdue, graduated, and was a professor in computer graphics, be a speaker, you know, and kind of talk about his um, experiences, at Purdue experiences. And being a graduate. Exactly. And, um, you know, we had donations from the community for food. And um, when it first was down there, let me ask, did people from the community also come? Or was it probably. Uh, it probably took a while because it, you're trying to get the you, you have to get the word out campus wide first. Right, right. And the secretary, um, she did a really good job of, of getting things sure. started um, and contacting people and let people know what was going on and get yeah. get the word out in publications and things of that right, sort. Right, right. And this and I want to say this was in the fall. This is in the fall of 2003 now, when the new secretary was hired. Because did Maricela come in? I think she came in 04. Did she? Right. I think so. Right. And, and <laughs> just like any organizations, they have their ups and downs. Um, I, for the life of me, I can't remember her name, the secretary. She was so nice. 
we had a student who kind of thought she was a director of the center. Um, and she was actually, who was the next president of the Latino Student Union. And it was a real interesting experience. I had never experienced anything, anything like that before. Um, she actually wasn't a student, and we thought she was a student. She, she was a student. She wasn't. Uh, she's not enrolled as a student. She wasn't, and so I found out because I was one of the advisors, and then Dean of Students is telling me, you need a new president. If you don't get a new president, your organization's going to be disbanded. And uh, She was the president, but she's not a student? She wasn't. I guess she had been a student, but at the time when... She was nominated, or in the fall when she became to become a president, she wasn't a student, and um, so we we had to scramble and try to get a new president. And uh, uh, little little touchy situation. It was very touchy. Yeah. It was very but it very touchy. Out. It's okay. And um, from what I understand, she got really angry and destroyed a lot of the records and a lot of the things that we had in the center. Because she, um, yeah, the, the, the secretary was there. She was like, I don't know what's going on. I said, I'm sorry. But it was a real hard time at that time because she wasn't a student. And I contacted Margaret Rowe, and I was like, I don't know what to do. you know. And she says, don't worry, I'll handle it. And then Margaret Rowe kind of handled it sure. and took over and took care of it. And took care of it. Right. She was yeah. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk a little bit. Tell us about your new, your position as Director of Diversity for College of Technology. I'm, yeah, I'm the Director of Diversity Programs in the College of Technology. The first, started, was there someone there before you? Uh, technically, yeah, there okay. was. Um, okay. Wes Campbell, who is the Director of um, Science Bound, he was the, the, the Director for Multicultural Programs. Is he, is he in Indianapolis? No, he's here. He's here. He's here. Okay. He's here. Right, okay. So the college had a like a minority program, but not a diversity program, right, if right. that makes sense. So sure. I'm technically, I guess, the first diversity director. Sure. The new dean wanted to emphasize on women as well as multicultural students. And so that's when the diversity office was created to include women and multicultural students. And so I came in... Um, in the spring of 2004, and um, all in, the only thing in place was a camp, a summer camp, which <laughs> nothing had been done for yet. Uh, which no was, campers. <laughs> uh, and, uh. and, you know, those were things that were coming up that I needed to kind of get going on right away. And so I, you know, formed these two made these two camps and had invitations, contacted admissions and said, you know, give me names of people I can invite, created a little brochure um, and worked with conferences and had our first camp. What, what for the researchers, tell them what kind of camps you were having? Um, one was a seventh and eighth grade camp for minority students, you know, um, African American, Hispanic, sure. Native American, Asian students. And then the other one was for 11th grade uh, or no seniors. It was called senior camp, and so it was be for 12th graders. They were going to be 12th oh, graders, okay. and I had probably 35 uh, seventh and eighth graders that came to the first camp, and and it was called the seventh and eighth grade camp. There was no names or anything like that, and the other one was called senior camp, and I had about 12 or 13 students that attended that camp. How did you happen to select seventh and eighth? Uh, that was something that they had already done oh, beforehand. Okay. So that's just I went Which with it because sure. I didn't have. Kind of time. And it's the beginning of junior high and then right. after middle school, so it exactly. sounds reasonable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, um, uh, then from there, you know, just started on creating programs for women, creating programs for um, multicultural students, and changing names. And um, right now, um, the seventh and eighth grade camp is called Total, turned on to technology and leadership. And um, the other camp that was for seniors, I kind of did away with that, and we created a program during the school year for juniors in high school. So we had a vision program, which 
had kind of been in place, but the year that I came, they hadn't done it. And then also one for females. One's called Vision for Multicultural Students in 11th Grade and Do It, Discovering Opportunities in Technology for Women in 11th Grade. And that way, we have them here for three or four uh, days. And Is this in the summer, though? No, this well? one's in the spring. Oh, okay. That's, that's the way it changed. And in the summer, I created then team technology expanding all minds for females so I wanted to have multicultural and the female program and this was for eighth and ninth grade females and invited them you know had activities uh, recruited or, or asked professors you know from each department to see if they would do a hands-on session and all the departments were very um, you know willing to support and then from that, you know, we did one for, with the Girl Scouts, a collaboration, and we got a TAGS, Technology Advances Girl Scout Camp for 5th, 6th, and 7th grade girls. It's nice to get those labels, and it takes a while to come up yeah, with Yeah, and so. I don't know, they just kind of popped in my head, and now we also have one that um, I had a grad student who was a cheerleader at Purdue at the time, and she wanted to do a camp with a cheerleading platform. And it, it used to be cheerleading in the classroom, now it's called Tech Technology Experiences Cheerleading. But that was another recent one that we added in the summer. And uh, we also then also, coll I collaborated with the Colleges of Engineering and Science and the LSAMP program, the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation. And we created an academic boot camp, a STEM academic boot camp. The first year, we piloted three different programs. Engineering did the STEM academic, I mean the boot camp. I did a program called Boost for two weeks, building orientation opportunities for students in technology. And science did a one week. We came together after that and said, you know, the five week program is much better. You know, it's a really good way to bridge. All at one time for it. Yeah, but to bridge that high school to the college um, experience. And so they came for five weeks and immersed them in math and science and English in some technology or engineering or, or science courses that they would be taking. And I just finished that just a few weeks ago. And we had, oh, together the three uh, colleges had probably 55 students, over 55 students. Are, so. Where do you draw them from? Are Indiana as well? Do you, do you, Martin, across the country, do you have uh, people that come as well, students? Yes. Okay. Um, we, the, the boot, most of my boot campers were from Indiana, a lot of them for the northern Indiana and the Indianapolis area, but we also had students um, from California, from Michigan, and I know that engineering had students from out of sure. state all over the place, yeah. Right. And then do they have some sessions on, if they're thinking about coming to Purdue, is that factored into as well, uh, about thinking about Purdue? Or right. Okay. See, that's what I was going to say. The okay. summer camps are more an outreach program. It's okay. kind of get them thinking about technology sure. and all the possibilities. Then I have two programs during the school year, Wow It, Windows of Opportunity for Women in Technology, which is only for high school students, and these are females. All four years in high school? Or just yeah, this one's for all four years in okay. high school to kind of introduce them again to technology majors and possibilities. And also changes maybe if they've been here before, what's, you know, what's down the pike or something. Exactly, just to kind of get them thinking that, right. hey, this is, this is a possibility for you. And then the 11th grade programs, which is the Vision program and the Do It program, for 11th grade multicultural students and 11th grade females. That one is the one that we heavily recruit and try to get them down that pipeline because the following year, they're gonna be seniors. We want them to apply, um, you know, hopefully get everything in, get admitted, and hopefully they'll matriculate. Yeah. After that, after they are admitted, then that's when we have the boot camp for the admitted students, the minority admitted students starts sometime usually in the end of June and it goes through early August and for five weeks we immerse them into some of the courses that they're going to have during the fall. Oh, that yeah. really gives them an introduction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so I have programs for females, programs for minority students. I mean, there's all other things that I do. I do star lunches for the admitted students. So when they come for star, I have a program just for the females so that they can meet some of the faculty and some of the staff that they'll be working with. And then the same thing with the minority students so that they can meet their advisors during STAR. We have a lunch for them and let them know of all the opportunities that are available for oh, them. One-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, and then um, 
we just we have recruitment we visit high schools and try to let them know about the college of technology and we do target areas like the region area in in and in the indianapolis area so because those two areas have a larger population of multicultural students right. and so and we're trying to recruit those students and so we do that as well um, have you built up, uh, since the camps have been going on, have you built up any kind of alumni that uh, have some of the people gone, do they come back and participate in it? And actually, um, or is it still I, too new? It's kind of new, but what we're looking at now is the students that have come through the camps, are they, um, I gotta keep going here, are they matriculating are they applying and those kinds okay. of things so that's one of the things that we're doing and but now since I've been here four or five years I'm starting to establish an alumni base I've got students that you know because I'm a, the advisor for the Minority Technology Association and the Women in Technology organization okay. um, and then you get some you'll get alums through that area as well as well and we have them come back and speak to the students and nice. and do those kinds of things as well that's so very nice yeah there's so many things that it's Lots it's never a dull minute it. moment oh that's great yeah yeah <laughs> I enjoy it that's uh, for sure um, let's in just a couple things uh, any hobbies special interests that you'd like to tell us about yeah actually I have several hobbies um, one of them is I make jewelry, um, and it helps me because and I, I... She is wearing one today. It's very pretty. <laughs> um, I, I share that with the students. Like, since I'm the advisor for the Women in Technology, you know, one of the nights we do beading, and I show them how to make jewelry. And um, I'm also, I help with the Women in Technology learning community, and that's one of the other things that I, I do. And so we do one of the nights and, and do jewelry, you know. I make my own cards, um, own individual, like handmade cards, and um, uh, scrapbooking is also a big, um, Super. fun uh, hobby that I have. But my favorite is, I'm a grandma, and I love my granddaughter. And How so old? She's three. And Does so, she live here? No, she lives she's in Utah with okay. her mom. She's the one that's in law school, so. So we don't get to see her too often. No, we do the video cam a lot, so that's. That helps a little that bit, helps, but it's not yeah. the same, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. <laughs> do you have uh, Do you belong to any professional associations, in, or in, in, in conjunction with your work that you're doing as in diversity? Are there any that uh, meetings that, that you go yeah, to? Yeah, well, there's several. You know, okay. we're part of the um, diversity roundtable. Okay. Part of the minority program, minority multicultural program directors. Um, and they meet on an annual basis? Uh, we know we meet regularly once okay. a month or, okay. or so. Good. Yeah. That's um, good. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. Very involved with my church activities as well. And um, you, you had mentioned earlier, your husband is also, oh, he's at Caterpillar, yeah, right? he's at That's Caterpillar. Right, exactly. okay. Yeah. And uh, the, been in the community quite a while. Yeah. I'm going to, in closing, if you want to make any closing comments or anything that you'd like to say. I guess I didn't realize I have been here so long. <laughs> um, and, yeah. And you've done quite a few things. I have. And, I and, have. Lo and you've been able to meet the challenges, which is terrific. I and think lots so. of interaction with the students. I think so. Yeah, I love the students. They keep me young and they keep me going. And you do it for them. Right. I really enjoy. And it's a two-way street. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, it's so neat to see them graduate and then become leaders in their communities and the things that they're doing. It's really wonderful. And you can stand back and look. Yes, yes. Right. And I feel like, yeah, you know, I helped a little bit maybe. Um, I want to say that the university has really done in the, you know, 16 years that I've been here at Purdue, in, in just in the community and then the 10 years that I've been here at Purdue, you know, I have seen a lot of positive changes towards, you know, helping diversity grow and, and in really making it a part of the university and in making it um, part of the strategic plan and it and part of the it family too. Yeah, and making it really an important part of, of, of the things that we're doing. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really happy to, to be able to have seen that and, and say that I've been a little bit a, a part of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's very good. I want to thank you very much. Oh. This can, thank you very much. You